going to be a lot of fun today. The contact center of the future is our discussion. Uh, we've got some great speakers today. Uh, I'm uh, doing the introductions. I'm John T. Pierce of Call Center Helper and delighted to be joined by uh, Dr. Nicola Millard, who's a customer experience futurologist at BT. Uh, and Doc, uh, and uh, Nicola is going to be taking us through five customer service predictions. And then we're going to be followed up by Mike Murphy from Interactive Intelligence. Mike's a, uh, a regular. Hello, Mike. Hello, Jossie. And uh, Mike's going to be taking us through five technology predictions. And I had to add a little bit of fun to these 10 predictions. We're going to be asking you in the audience whether you think each prediction is either a hit with that sound effect or a miss with that sound effect. So we'll be able to get a really good crowdsourcing of what we think the future will look like. Uh, we're also going to do top tips and predictions from you in the audience. We go to say something like 2003. And I'd just like you to, in one or two words, put the answer to the, the chat room or onto the question box if you're not quite logged in there. Uh, what, in one or two words, how would you describe the contact center of 10 years ago? So would you describe, here's a couple of examples, transactional, noisy, exciting, We've got a few answers here. Neris says it was functional. Will stigmatized. Okay. Uh, Adam says it archaic, was archaic. Uh, Virginia disjointed. Basic. Some of the other answers were coming through thicker bar. Chaotic, perfunctory, antiquated, dated, basic, smoky. Wow. <laughs> Offensive, noisy, and basic. Um, it was a call center, not a contact center. Chaotic, extinct, controversial, pressurized. Sales focus, noisy, disconnected, chaotic, and inefficient. Wow, I think we've moved on quite a long way from there. So what I'd like, now like to jump forward, and this is some of the, uh, we've got a sort of sneak preview question from the uh, research that um, Nicola's been uh, working on, which I'd like to do a poll now, which is uh, what do you think will be the primary function of the call center in the year 2020, so we're looking seven years ahead, uh, do you think it will be inbound transactional contact handling? You only allowed one vote, by the way, on this. Complex problem solving, equivalent to back office support today. Cross-selling, upselling, proactive outbound contact, or complaint handling? The, uh, the results coming back from the uh, audience is quite a, quite a spread, but there is one clear, there's one clear winner emerging out of this. And uh, indeed, we all, at this point, believe it's likely to be complex problem solving equi equivalent effectively to the back office support of today. If there's any um, answers you think we haven't got on here, if you just want to put into the chat room, which is on callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat, proactive outbound contact, 20%. That's quite a, uh, quite a large uh, uh, figure there, Nicola. Yeah, and I think that's um, somewhat driven by the fact that obviously social media may well also be playing uh, a little bit into the outbound contact piece. So I think uh, it's not necessarily just outbound calling. I think uh, possibly proactivity could be very, very multi-channel. Yeah. And probably the slowest on there, the uh, smallest on there, is the inbound transactional contact handling, which is perhaps where, where perhaps where, where we've come from, and uh, you know will be a gradual decline. So Absolutely. Quite interesting. Well, let's have a look then, and we'll see how that ties into some of the uh, predictions that we've got from uh, from our from our speakers. So I'm deli delighted uh, that uh, we're joined by Dr. Nicola Millard, who's a customer experience futurologist at BT. And Nicola is going to be taking us through five customer service predictions. So if you'd just like to uh, line the slides up, and um, we'll get the first predictions, and then we can uh, Take a little vote on whether we think they are hits or misses. Fabulous. Well, fa thank you, John T. Um, I ought to explain a little bit where this data has come from because, uh, obviously, firstly, I am a futurologist, but I'm not really a futurologist. A lot of this stuff is happening now. So um, we have had a long discussion as to whether I should change my job title to nowologist or soonologist, possibly. But um, what I'm going to talk through today in, in a very, very uh, a quick uh, format um, is some results from um, a BT study that we published about three months ago called the, the Autonomous Customer. Um, it's actually a poll of um, uh, 
1,500 customers in the US and in the UK. Um, this is actually a, a piece of work that we've done um, for a number of years now. And the interesting thing is we did this, exactly the same survey three years ago in both the US and the UK. So some of the stuff I'm going to be showing today is also the difference between simply three years ago and today. And there is a surprising amount of change just in the three years. So what I'm going to do is to give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the key trends that are coming out of that research. So the first trend we're going to cover is the trend towards, if I can get the slides to move, um, I've got my technical support. Fantastic. Thank you so much. The first one is really around the um, the interesting thing around loyalty. Um, interestingly enough, as we uh, as we compare the data from three years ago to today, we've seen a decline in loyalty. And actually, that's been happening year on year for about the past five years. So we've got 50% of people in the UK now saying that they're not really loyal anymore. Loyalty is a thing of the past. 44% overall. Um, so we've got this huge debate. And I actually I spoke at a loyalty conference last week, and it is a little bit of a downer to start to, uh, a keynote at a loyalty conference by going, hello, guys, loyalty is a bit dead, isn't it? So um, so a apart from the fact that actually I don't believe it is, um, one of the things that we have been looking on the trend is, OK, if loyalty is dead, is there something else driving uh, customers to come back? And actually, the one very interesting trend that we've again been picking up over the past few years is around this concept of easy or effort. Um, now, effectively, although people are saying they're not loyal anymore, what they're actually saying, 74% of people you are come back if you make it easy for me to do that. So easy is becoming one of those rather interesting buzzwords at the moment. If you go to any, any customer experience co uh, conference, generally someone will mention effort and easy. Um, so we've done quite a lot of work on this um, in BT. So uh, we've been looking at a lot of drivers around the easy. And for one thing, things like value for money is quite an interesting one. When we ask people, do you feel as if you've got real value for money and they've had a difficult, ex uh, difficult experience, they say no. So we're seeing a lot of correlation um, with easy and loyalty, more so than maybe satisfaction. And certainly the cat was thrown amongst the pigeons about uh, about 2010 when Harvard Business Review said, forget about satisfying your customers, um, just make it easy for them. So we decided in BT we wanted to look at easy because I think we, we will admit that we're maybe not sometimes the most easy company to do business with. So we took easy on about two years ago um, and started to look at, well, firstly, how do you measure it? Um, because like most companies, unless you measure it and manage it and put costs associated with it against it, people probably won't do it. So we actually took a leaf from the book of the Net Promoter Score. Um, and we effectively translated Net Promoter into what we call the Net Easy Score. So effectively, in the uh, we take customer surveys. We have about 12 million customers in the UK. We survey about 10% of them a year. We ask them lots of questions. We do ask them whether they're the, the net promoter uh, question. We ask them the satisfaction question. But we've added, how easy was it to uh, get the help you wanted today? And we ask them to rank us on a 1 to 7 scale, where 1 is incredibly easy and 7 is really, really difficult. Um, and then we net it. So we either get a positive or a negative score. Um, the interesting thing is that with the two years of data we now have on this, we can see firstly that people who are finding it easy to do business with us are 40% less likely to churn than people that are finding us extremely difficult. And similarly, when we look at churn data, uh, we can see that a lot of people have ranked us as extremely difficult to do business with. Now, why am I talking about this in relation to the contact center, you may ask? Well, the first thing that we found, certainly when we start to analyze our net easy scores, is that around 70% of, uh, of, uh, of the score is a lot to do with the contact center. Um, so firstly, it's very much around the advisor. So not just having lovely people, but, you know, uh, is the advisor knowledgeable? Do you get through to the right person? That's another thing driving that easy score. The ability to navigate through the website, through IVRs is very important. Keeping the customer informed about their problem. And of course, things like the number of times you've had to contact and the timeliness of that contact. So you can start to see that this is actually a very significant measure, potentially, into the future for the contact center. 
Center. So, Jonty, I believe we are going to take a bit of a poll from the audience as to whether this is a hit or a miss. Do yeah, people so think easy is going to be a factor? So what we want to do is just for you in the audience to vote whether you think uh, prediction easy is the new loyalty is a hit or a miss. So if you'd just like to uh, vote on that now, just wait for the uh, answers to come in on there. And um, well, I think you'd be absolutely uh, delight, delight, delighted to know there that 95% of the audi audience uh, believe that it is a hit. Yay. So uh, well done on that one. <laughs> Thank you, audience. <laughs> What's your next prediction? Okay, let's let's have a go at number two then. So if I click on that, that's fabulous. Right, number two prediction. Omni-channel. I love this word omni. It's much nicer than multi-channel. I must admit I have no idea what the difference between omni and multi is, but omni is so much nicer to say. So what you're seeing here is um is quite an interesting thing. Um the reason we call this survey the autonomous oh, customer Nicola, is largely we get you need to actually share your slides. Customers largely Hello. Oh, hi. We can't actually oh, see your well, slides at the moment. Sorry about that. Brilliant. Well, you're there you not go. <laughs> Here we go. Fabulous. Right. No worries. We are. We hopefully are back. You should be able to see lots of little arrows now. Um, yes, you're not just hallucinating. Um, so, basically, the autonomous customer survey tells us that customers largely don't want to contact us. Um, they they quite like it if you make it easy for them to serve themselves. Um, the interesting thing is when we ask them what's their primary channel that they'd like to communicate with organizations uh, now, compare that with three years back, we are seeing distinct fallers and risers. Um, so the key fallers, um, interestingly the phone, 77% um, of people are still ranking that as a primary channel. It only actually went down 3% in the past three years. And interestingly enough, we've done this survey globally as well. Even in Asia, we're seeing that we're seeing some very, very strange behaviours in Asia, but they are still lifting the phone when they want to contact an organisation. There are a number of reasons for that. Firstly, it's easy. Um, the phone is a very accessible mechanism. It's a very trusted mechanism. So the phone is going down, but it's not going down by much. Email, by comparison, is plummeting. And certainly there are a number of reasons for that. It's quite an inefficient channel. It's like playing tennis. You lob an email in, you have another one back, you lob another one in. So, And, and obviously the delay factor as well. It's not a real-time conversation. And also, if you ask an average 14-year-old about email, they will generally roll their eyes and go, well, that's so last year. Why would I bother with that? So we've got, we've got those as the fallers. Um, interestingly, the web is pretty much maintaining its uh, position as a fairly solid way of interacting with organizations, but it's neither gone up or down. And then we've got the key risers. Web chat is where my money's at, and I will talk about web chat in a second, so I'm not going to say too much about that now. But certainly we're seeing the rise of the app, largely because we're seeing the rise of the smartphone, more on that later. Um, we are seeing social media go up, but one of the things that we're finding with social media is typically it's a secondary mechanism for talking to companies rather than a primary one because it's in public, largely. And the other thing is we don't generally go, well, I've got a problem, I'm going to tweet them. Some customers, a very minority of customers will, um, but not everyone. It's all in public in social media. So we are seeing that go up. And then we've got a quite small but significant rise in, in things like video conferencing. Certainly we have seen in the past three years the use of video at home go up 100%, largely because of things like FaceTime and Skype. So we, we can see the risers and fallers, but we also know that generally we're goal-directed as customers, and we will go to the channel that we think is going to get us to our goal. Hence, one in two of us are saying we continuously swap. If one channel fails, we go to another. And then we've got an old traditional challenge, because of course as soon as we stop swap channels, we have to start again frequently. So it's a dilemma that we've had for many, many years around how on earth do we as organizations make it easy and consistent to switch between one channel and another without the need for the customer to repeat their problem. So prediction two is around on the rise of omni-channel. But I'm going to link that with prediction number three, which is where my bet is at, because uh, I firmly think that web chat is the channel to watch rather than the much hyped social media channel. And I have a number of reasons uh, that I say this. I am an academic, so I like putting some figures behind it. 
the figures you can see up there are actually, that's a study we did, um, we published about four or five months ago on WebJack six companies that had actually implemented it, you will see some of the reasons why it's growing. Firstly, customers often start online, therefore it's very easy for them to push a button rather than necessarily find a phone. Um, so customers actually find it very, very easy to do, so the, it links into the easy piece. Interestingly enough, when we asked the advisors about web chat, they also ranked it incredibly highly. In fact, some of, it loved, some of them loved it so much, they wanted to marry web chat. Um, they liked it for a number of reasons. So they liked it because they don't have to make small talk. There's no such thing as on hold on a web chat. And also because you're not as isolated as you are on the phone, you can start to ask questions of people around you. So um, generally, um, advisors really liked web chat. Um, the other thing is obviously liking it is not going to get the business case signed off. So uh, we are seeing this. 15% increase in productivity compared to phone. Obviously, that is because if you have the volume, you can put one advisor on multiple chat sessions. I have seen up to 10. I do not recommend that because we're getting complexity thrown into this channel, um, as we are indeed in the phone channel as well. So uh, we're, I generally say maybe two to three simultaneous chat sessions rather than necessarily 10 on very complex things. So for example, I'm doing some work in the health service at the moment. You wouldn't want to accidentally tell a man he's pregnant. So, you know, you really do need to pay attention if you're on multiple chat sessions. The figure that's not up here is an interesting one on the study we have just done around cross-sell and upsell, which is also showing that we, we get a very successful conversion rate, 60 to 70 percent conversion rate on cross-sell to upsell sell as well, because customers are usually genuinely interested in the product by the time they've clicked through. So, um, so web chat, that's my prediction, rather than social media being the biggest growing channel in the future. Now, I think we're going to do a double poll now, John T. Yes, what we're going to do is we're going to get you to vote on prediction uh, two and prediction three. So the first prediction is that omni-channel will uh, uh, accelerate, if you'd like to vote on whether you think that's a hit or a miss. And secondly, uh, on web chat, not social media. So if you think uh, social media is going to, to uh, be the dominant uh, form, hit uh, social media. If you think it's web chat, hit uh, hit uh, hit it. So, uh, <laughs> sure, that didn't make perfect sense. <laughs> Just like to uh, vote on those now. Seeing oh, a bit of a different spread on these uh, on these two. Not quite as uh, cut and dry. So let's see if it's going to be a hit or miss. Let's just share the results with you. And the, the results are, oh, we've got two hits. Yay. Well done. Um, a bit of a, a, a divergence. I think most people agree that Omnichannel will accelerate, uh, but 21% of people don't necessarily believe that web chat is going to be the channel of the, uh, or, or the bigger of the uh, uh, biggest growing channel there. So uh, quite interesting, uh, quite interesting results. Let's pass the uh, baton back to you. Uh, uh, back to you there, and we'll see if we can carry on with predictions four and five. Fantastic. Thank you, John T. Let's go for number four then. Now, I always say smartphones are always consistently the scariest bit of the data that we've been getting through recently because smartphones do, well, once we are given the internet in the palm of our hands, we do become slightly monster customers. So, um, uh, so we can see there are some very fundamental changes in the way that we're shopping, for example. So we get um, the phenomena in the retail space of showrooming because people are simultaneously in a physical store and online at the same time. So what we wanted to do with this data was to really start to figure out what kind of behavior was this driving. And what we initially found out um, on the US-UK data was that there is a very distinctive age split in these behaviors. So if you are under 34, the chances are you are using all the wonderful capabilities that a smartphone will give you, ranging from QR codes to rapid downloading of vouchers to get a bargain. You're becoming very savvy shoppers. Um, use of location-based services, so actually just getting the information that's local to you. It's turned the internet local. But the really interesting stat here is they're also very, very likely to call you. As we are also likely to call as well, which is where we, we sort of start to see some very good apps now have kind of 
have realized that this is happening and they're starting to embed service and the contact center within those apps. So we are certainly seeing that trend. Now, the big thing about this one, when you look at customer experience design especially, is that these under 34-year-olds, because they are being very savvy, they are being very omni-channel, so they're using the app, they're using the website, um, they're comparing the data between the two, and if, it, if, it, if they don't match, they get confused. They will also get confused if the contact center tells them something completely different, and indeed if the physical retail store or branch has something completely different to say as well. So the first challenge for these guys is because they are very omni-channel, very well informed, supercharged by their smartphone, they actually are a nightmare to design customer experience for. So the boundaries start to blur between the app, the website, the contact center, and the physical space very much with these under 34-year-olds, very connected, smartphone-savvy customers. Now, the over 55s, however, are largely using their smartphone as a phone. So we do have a very, very different demographic and age split going on there. Now, interestingly enough, at the moment in the UK, um, we've got about 62% of the population have a smartphone. When you get into Asia, we get into the 90%. And certainly you start to see some incredibly, incredibly savvy behaviors from those consumers there. So that may well be our future. So that's prediction four. It kind of links into prediction five as well, which is that if you get these monster customers, these customers that are, well, 49% are saying, well, actually, I'll, I'll only bother to call you when I've got a complex or emotive question. You can see why the contact center model, which is a model that we've, well, to be honest, it hasn't changed hugely since the 80s. It's starting to creak. Because the one thing the contact center model is not necessarily that good at dealing with is complexity. So hence we get autonomous customers saying all these things around they possibly know more than customers, or at least they think they know more than customers. Um, they have, they, on hold is a really interesting one. It's a sign of weakness if you put a customer on hold. Uh, the, the advisor hasn't known what's on the website. So all of these things are really things that are becoming very obvious to these very, very omni-channel customers. So we're getting an increase of complexity. The big question is, how do we handle complexity within organizations? And that's where we started. We spotted this trend maybe about three, four years ago, this hike into complexity. And we said, how on earth do you handle this in an organization? So we came up with something that we call the networked expert model, which is effectively saying, who deals with complexity? Well, Experts do. Where are experts? Well, actually, experts could be anyone. And of course, if you play that with trends into the technology space, which you're going to hear from Mike in a minute, but put into things like cloud, effectively all you need to become an expert and part of the contact center is a browser. So this starts to open up things. So the first thing is know your experts. Where are your experts? Some of them may be in a traditional contact center space. Actually, some of them could be home-based. Some of them could be in a retail store with an iPad. They could be in the field. They could be absolutely anywhere. So the first thing, find your expert. Next thing, is my expert around? So you need presence information into this system. Then you need to speed date, literally, the expert with the complex uh, inquiry, regardless of the channel. doesn't really matter. So it's like skills-based routing on acid. And the next thing you need, because this could be anarchy, everyone is now potentially talking to anyone, you need accountability. And certainly if you're in a regulated market, you need to be able to measure, to manage, to regulate. So that's where things like workflow management and CRM really do come into play. Now we're seeing this model start to evolve already because of the hike in expertise in things like financial services. But it is challenging for the contact center because effectively, I wrote a blog uh, actually a, a few uh, it's about a year ago, actually, that was originally called Is Your Back End, Now Your Front End. Um, it got censored, um, so I, it got called something very boring. But, but effectively, what we're seeing is a lot of things that we might call back office functions are now becoming very, very primary functions for the front office because they are the complex questions that customers are asking. So, John C., a double poll again, I believe. We have, a, we have indeed got a, a double poll. Some quite nice, uh, quite nice comments through the one I've... Uh, Particularly like is one from uh, uh, one from uh, one of our 
Frida Sue said, uh, experts are like ninjas. They can be anywhere. Uh, which I thought, uh, nice. I like it. <laughs> Ninja experts. Nice one here. So let's have a, a look at the uh, um, predictions four and five. So just like to vote if you think that smartphones will fundamentally change behaviors. Uh, like to vote on that one. Uh, hit or miss. And prediction five, the contact center model will change and will uh, favor things like the network uh, expert in action. So if you'd just like to uh, vote on those. And uh, well, Nicola, I think you've uh, scored five out of uh, five here. Wow. The, the uh, audience has pretty well agreed on that. So that's very <laughs> kind audience. Thank well, you. Uh, well done on that. So uh, <laughs> quite a quite a quite a good uh, a good amount of fun here. A uh, question. I've got a number of questions. Quite an interesting one. Uh, it's come in. Has web chat reduced incoming callers? Um, I think there is a relationship between, yes, I think that, that, that certainly in organizations that are using web chat in a very sophisticated way are showing that maybe the phone is, is uh, the volumes are going down. However, um, often on the very complex stuff, voice still really dominates. So even you start maybe on the web chat, possibly you might then switch to a phone call at some point. But um, yeah, I mean, there is, there is evidence all these channels interact with each other. So web chat can reduce some of the, the, uh, the traditional um, voice volumes for sure. So what I'd like to now do is go and have a look in the uh, from the audience and see what we think is a, an audience. The pr principal role of the contact center manager is going to be in 2020. This will feed into some of the research that Nicola is going to be conducting both here at Call Center Expo next week, and then I think you've you've got a survey that uh, will be going out after. We will be putting a survey online, and if you're also going to the CCMA UK meeting, we'll do it do it there too. So do you think the principal role of a contact center manager will be a coach providing uh, steer and development advice for agents? Do you think it will be, be a guru providing expertise for both agents and customers? Do you think it's going to be the accountant uh, tracking cost, profit and loss, possibly even becoming a, a sort of profit center? Do you think it will be a quality auditor responsible for quality monitoring and standards? Or do you think it's going to be a customer experience guardian? understanding customer demand and feeding it back to the rest of the business. So you're only allowed one vote on this, so if you'd just like to uh, vote on what you think the answer to that poll is. Let's take a couple more answers through. Mike, any, any thoughts? Oh, I think um, number five, I would hope, should be a high score. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, well, I think uh, gosh, all the predictions seem to be ever so spot on today. Um, <laughs> So far, yes, the answer is 63% uh, of us believe that the contact center will be the customer experience guardian, understanding customer demand and feeding it back to the business. Now, it'd be interesting to see what, I uh, should do another poll, see what people think we are today and what voyage we need to get from here to, 20, uh, to 2020 in the next seven years. That's not terribly far away in terms of uh, the overall, uh, overall roadmap. So some quite uh, quite interesting food for food for thought there. Um, just a reminder that we are uh, carrying out the conversation in the chat room, callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. So there's a lot of discussion going on there. If you've got any questions or tips or even predictions for the future, uh, I'd like to put those into the chat room or into the question box. And we've got a bottle of champagne uh, later on for the best tip and for the best prediction. So, delighted now to hand across to Mike Murphy from Interactive Intelligence, and uh, Mike's a regular, well-known, well-liked uh, panelist on uh, a number of our webinars. And Mike's going to take us through uh, five technology predictions for the future. And um, uh, so, Mike, I'd just like to load your slides up onto the screen. We've had a couple of technical issues with some people in the audience not getting through. They're not quite there yet. I'd love to see the hand of it. Let's just change. Yes, perfect. Hang on, and we'll go again. And hopefully, there we are. Perfect. We should be good. Yes, we can see it now. Excellent. Thank you, John T. And thank you, Nicolette. What a very interesting webinar we're having today. Very different. I can feel the burden of pressure coming crunching down on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas, five out of five. So um, 
I'm, I'm relying on the audience to help me here. <laughs> but uh, I've prepared five ideas, really, that I think, think will make our lives and our, probably more importantly, our customers' lives a lot easier in the future. So um, from that perspective, I want to kick off really with the cloud and um, very much seeing this as a sort of major change, if you will, in, in the contact center space and how we're kind of seeing functionality being delivered. And um, you know, from my perspective and my experience, you know, we know that keeping it simple is the best formula really for success. However, in the contact center world, really, I think we should all agree that keeping it simple is kind of hard to do because there's lots of customers involved and more importantly, there's lots of technology involved. And that really, I think, is a, is a challenge for us because when we have lots of individual technology components where you know, lots and lots of our agent information is spread over different systems and lots and lots of our customer information is spread over different systems, getting these systems to coordinate and kind of think logically about a customer often kind of lets us down badly and often we kind of uh, if you like to make silly mistakes in front of our customers and, and those kind of things really. So my vision for the future really is that, you know, all in one sort of software based, um, uh, if you like, cloud based applications I think are definitely going to be a winner um, going forward. And um, when you kind of see this little graphic here, what I see in the contact center are really that, that sort of sh shopping list of things that you expect like uh, multi-channel or omni-channel, maybe IVR, maybe analytics, workforce management that kind of list that we're familiar with is like the day-to-day -day tools that we work with. Kind of think of those already embedded into that contact center module. But then to the left, we have the unified communications part, really, where the rest of the organization now have a role to play in how we sort of work with our customers. And from that perspective, like Nicola mentioned, they are the experts often, so they have to be part of that picture. So being able to sort of bring them into like a, a, a single sort of management would be very helpful, I think, in, in sort of like how we look at technology going forward. And then the third piece really is, well, you know, think, of, think of each other as teams. We have the contact center team sort of working with our customer, and then we have the back office team, if you like, working with our customer also. And in a way, what we sort of think is that automation can really help us to sort of like organize the teams behind keeping the customer happy. And the simple things there would be, if we make a promise to a customer, keep it, regardless of who makes that promise. And these um, automation tools will allow us to make sure we keep that promise and escalate if we don't. Uh, similarly, if it's a case where um, <clears throat> something has to change, then you know, allow automation to help invoke change. But the point being, because it's like a single system, it kind of allows us to kind of put in the cloud a very capable and strong application for us to reach. Now, I kind of think for the first time, we have this notion of like self-improvement because I'm kind of seeing what's happening with my customers. My team, if you like, is now organized behind solving those customer problems. And if you like, by seeing those problems go away, surely we're going to see a reduction in the sort of traffic coming into the contact center because I'm not actually annoying my customers and causing them to pick up the phone to me. So this is what we, we believe, certainly, that going forward, you know, all in one app platform, cloud-based, would be very much a critical part of success in the contact center going forward. So that's my first topic. And then I've got a second topic, which is quite interesting to see. Um, this is the feedback from the, from the audience as well. So the idea of a mobile supervisor. Um, what I'm talking about here really is tablets. So we're all familiar now with tablets in our lives, at home and at work. We know the freedom of Wi-Fi. So by kind of bringing a tablet tool into the contact center, you know, a very simple thing is I can sort of get instant access to my real-time statistics, which is pretty cool, pretty friendly. But there's also some nice adjuncts to that, which are like agent location. So I am a sort of mobile supervisor now, so I'm not desk bound. I can kind of, I can kind of roam the contact center and sort of go and talk to my agents and sort of be side by side with house with them. I can also see if somebody's in difficulty, so I can sort of find them, you know, where are they? and sort of go and sort of speak to them. Um, I want to sort of be able to sort of carry on monitoring. Just because I'm a roaming supervisor doesn't mean I've lost my responsibility to do my supervisor role. So from that perspective, to be able to be part of the, you know, agent's got a difficulty, press for assistance, and up comes the sort of like the request onto my iPad, allows me to sort of carry on being that sort of mobile supervisor, doing things like monitoring and doing things like coaching my people properly. So I think for that, that, that comment about like coaching and sort of like helping my team improve, this is going to be a really powerful and sort of winning tool in the contact center of the future, and I look forward to the audience's feedback. So with that, Shanti, let's um, see what they say. Okay, let's have a look at uh, uh, what we've got on the predictions for the cloud and for mobile uh, uh, mobile supervisors. So if you'd like to visit, vote hit or miss for the cloud, hit and miss for mobile supervisors. And do you believe that the cloud is actually going to replace on-premise space? Solutions. I really believe in time, Jonathan. Uh, yes, it will. Yes, it will. I really see that the complexity of the technology is just becoming too difficult for, for on-premise organizations to marshal. Yeah. 
So it'll take a bit longer for the larger ones, but for sure, the majority of um, activity at the moment is very, very much cloud driven. Okay, so we've um, uh, let's have a look at the uh, look, let's have a look at the uh, results there. And uh, whoa, an overwhelming uh, majority go for the cloud. Mobile supervisors, though, oh, we're a bit uh, okay. a little bit more um, uh, a few more doubters on that. So Mike, that's two hits for two hits for you. Thank you and the uh, gentleman in the audience says, um, "Will software ever take over from Access or Excel databases?" <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's probably going to be the last, <laughs> the very last bastion. Uh, that's in there. So uh, let's just hide this poll and we'll uh, change across to you, uh, Mike, and uh, let's have a look at uh, predictions uh, eight and nine. Well, thank you, audience, for that support. I really appreciate it. But um, I'm going to be challenged now for this section, so bear with me. Put your seatbelts on and hold on tight. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, something which, you know, I've been actually involved with contact centers, like real life day to day involvement with contact centers. And the first one I touched in my career was in 1990, sadly. Um, and there was an issue with that particular customer, and it was around having a single view of the customer. And um, what sort of tickled me today was really how much improvement have we made on that sort of ambition to have a, you know, immediate access for an agent with all the information I need to know about my customer. And we've all kind of been involved with, or we've, we've kind of seen how CRM projects have been involved, and sometimes we love them, and sometimes we don't necessarily love them so much. Um, but have they really sort of cracked this sort of like the instant access to what I need to answer my customers' questions at that moment? I'm not so sure. So a, a kind of a different perspective on this challenge um, is what I'm going to talk about here, really. And, and we kind of call it content management, something which has been released only in the last couple of days. And it's very simple. We're kind of talking about documentation, um, being able to you know, view it, being able to put some notes on it, and being able to search for it, and kind of move that around the organization just like we would contacts, calls, inbound, outbound, that kind of thing. But what also allows me to do is actually manage any type of content. Um, so I'm talking here about maybe something that's already in files, perhaps, on paper, and kind of in volume lifting that from paper into software and creating like a repository of all my customer touches uh, over the history in a nice chronological order. Now, the beauty of this is the repository, if you will, brings me down to like folders for customers, and in there I can put anything, like uh, information about their emails, information about the last time they spent some time on our website, maybe some SMS messages, or whatever touch I've made with that customer, perhaps even the call recording that was like um, you know, part of that particular um, customer's last inquiry. Uh, maybe the customer made some you know, feedback comments to their last interaction with us. That can go into this kind of repository. So it kind of allows us to really gather up a good intimate understanding of how that customer feels at this time and sort of share it with the, the wider sort of community of the, of the business, not just the contact center team. And in that sort of comment of sharing, it's not just humans that we can share it with, we can also share it with automation. So again, we're able to sort of leverage the fact that you know, delivering service in the future will necessarily always involve humans. Uh, we see software and like uh, process automation, if you will, being a critical part of that. So fulfilling just customers' change requests, like I'd like to change my delivery address, or I'd like to change my order, I'd like to return something. Kicking off those kind of requests from apps or smartphones or from the websites, because they're very straightforward now to be able to be fulfilled in automation. And guess what? The automation goes to the same repository and kind of looks up the last number of transactions and spots something that it needs to help sort of fulfill that request for the customer. Um, or even the case where using the, um, the automation to maybe look for some trends and look for some behaviors. And with that, we know this customer is an opportunity, perhaps, or we know this customer is in danger of kind of switching. So maybe we should like up our activity in this customer and try and make sure they don't switch away from us. Those type of things. So we're kind of seeing the automation tool being very broad in its reach and capability yet being a very simple and straightforward part of that customer relationship. So I think it's a winner, but I appreciate, guys, there's been a you know, lot to explain there. But let's, let's see what you so we've think. Got, we've, got one score. we've got one more to, uh, to go up. Yes, we do. Yes, indeed. So the, the next one, really, then, is um, around mobile customer care. And this kind of bridges on what Nicola commented earlier about smartphones and apps, basically. So um, yes, we're all familiar with apps now on our devices. They're pretty like a nice, elegant way, if you like, to interact with a supplier and sort of maybe order some goods or change my requirements or that kind of thing. Very frequently, we're coming across the help section on the app being a bit of a letdown because where I had a very exciting and sort of like you know, cool and elegant way to interact, suddenly I've got this like, okay, call the contact center because that's the only way I'm going to help you or send an email to service at such and such an email address. And I think that's really, really crude and a bit of a cul-de-sac really for the customer experience. So we're advocating like a sort of a, a snap-on to the end of those existing apps where we can kind of take that customer in the same sort of way through the app 
into the contact center and make a smart inquiry to find out, okay, I know who the customer is, I know what app they're on, they have been verified, um, I know what they've been working on. So can I actually answer their query in automation? Perhaps I can, and that's what's going to be fulfilling and delightful for the customer because you've solved my problem. If I need to speak to somebody, what well, can I sort of do a screen pop? I'm actually doing a, a screen pop which actually is meaningful to the agent. So again, I don't repeat myself to the customer, uh, and I don't actually annoy the customer by asking silly questions again and again. I actually get to the point of resolve. And that, I think, will sort of help these sort of apps grow in their sort of take-up, and if you like, really close down the barrier, if you will, of things like you know, silly IVRs and double asking the, the customer the same question over and over again. So those three, John, I think are ones for the future. Okay, yeah. Well, let's have a look for, from an audience perspective of uh, do you believe the single view of the customer and mobile customer care? So it's just like to vote on whether you're a uh, hit or a miss. Just like to uh, put your uh, votes in there. I think some quite um, interesting food for thought, particularly like the idea of coming off a, off a mobile app and uh, going Absolutely. straight into yeah. Going straight into the. Uh, I found it really irritating to get a help page that says call straight into the contact center. So let's have a look, see what the uh, results are saying on that one. I know that uh, made Mike particularly uh, uh, nervous beforehand uh, because I said, uh, well, a single view of the customer, isn't that, wasn't that what we were saying 25 years ago? Please. Um, but, uh, and we're still probably not quite there yet. Um, oh, excellent. So we've got <laughs> two hits. Well done, Mike. Um, Mobile customer care is sort of a 21% a, a, a uh, yep. of the audience of the doubters there. So let's come on to your last uh, prediction, which I think is um, <laughs> absolute corker, this one. So uh, okay. uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's very, very uh, forward thinking, but I think could be quite, uh, could be <laughs> quite controversial. So Mike, let's, let's spill the beans. Okay. Um, sorry? <laughs> Are you predicting the score? <laughs> So this is uh, a corker, and this is uh, controversial. So um, we're actually calling it the transparent contact center. And, um, and the, the notion really behind this idea really is allowing the customers to choose which agents they're actually going to engage with to solve their problem in real time. So um, gas of breath all around, I imagine. But take, for example, a, and here is a, an example of a customer who spent quite a bit of money on a very sophisticated camera. Uh, he spent equally uh, quite a bit of money on a very, very um, expensive lens, but he's finding that on his photographs he's getting sort of like dead pixels, which is most irritating. So he's he's on the actual website of the um, manufacturer, he's kind of gone through the FAQ, it's come back with some helpful suggestions on how to solve the problem, and the fact is, yes, actually, we can solve this problem. And in fact, uh, a colleague, John Doe, is pretty good at solving this problem, based upon previous customer um, requests to solve this problem. John actually got a five-star rating on actually fixing it for customers. So, you know, I'm starting to feel a bit enthused that I can get rid of my dead pixel problem. However, I'm also being offered the choice to speak to the next available agent, as you would sort of normally expect, or what about choosing my agent? And then um, being presented then, if I say, well, pick my agent, I then get a visibility in real time of who's available at the moment, who's got the right language skill that I need, who actually understands the camera that I actually have, and who also understands the sophisticated lens I also have. So I'm starting to narrow down, if you will, my search to find the right people in the organization to help me. And these guys may be in the contact center, but they may also not be in the contact center. And this kind of goes on the point that Nick was mentioning about the expert. Where is the expert? And from that perspective, being able to visually see before I choose who to connect with gives me the customer choice. And customers like choice. They feel empowered by that. And another little thing you'll see here, if you like, is the idea of rating. So um, the ability for customers who sort of engage with these guys and sort of have a good experience or a bad experience can kind of you know, let, let the let the applications know how they feel about it, and through automation we can gather up those results and you can see the sort of ratings for each individual. So I think it's kind of, you know, a corker. <laughs> it's kind of controversial, John T. But I think the um, context of the future may well include this kind of capability. And I look forward to the opinion of the audience. So I think that's very, certainly, Mike, very, uh, very forward thinking there. Uh, I think, you know, the transparent contact center is something that we've... Um, we, we experience to some extent with social media makes things yep. Uh, yep. a lot more transparent and we may not always want it to, to appear uh, transparent. So let's just go to the uh, audience now, now and we'll uh, get the vote on the very last <laughs> prediction there and see whether it's a hit or a miss. So uh, let's, have a, let's have a look here and um, so I'd just like to vote on... The tension is rising. Tension, tension is rising actually. <laughs> I've got to say that a lot of these are actually... Uh, 
often too close to call. And uh, so let's just share the results there. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, well done. It was getting very close to it, but it didn't. It didn't. It came out. It came out good. So there we are. <laughs> and uh, now that's an interesting one, the transparent call center. I, I, agree. I, I think, yeah, it's a bit of a shock. I mean, I'm certainly putting the ratings of our agents online, I think, is going to cause all sorts of ruptures from a management perspective. But I, I, I think that that one could well have surprising legs. So there we are. That's 10 predictions for the, uh, <laughs> for the contact center. We're going to move on in a minute to your predictions. What I find is quite interesting, we've done 10 predictions for the contact center, and the word video hasn't come up once. So on video, if you'd like to put that into the, uh, into the box below. So, right, time for you in the audience to um, uh, put your uh, predictions uh, up on the screen, and uh, hopefully you can see uh, everything we've got coming through. And... Um, just going to uh, get the questions up onto the up on the screen now. Need to press the button here, and um, hopefully you can now all see some of the uh, things coming up. So right, let's take a couple of tips first, then we'll take some uh, take some predictions. So we've had a tip from Lee. Lee says many people who work in contact centres probably have the ability and experience to become the experts we were talking about. Contact centers typically have high attrition, but you can reduce this through being bold and empowering the brightest and best of staff and helping them to de develop into experts now. I see you nodding yeah. heartily um, with that. I mean, I'm, I'm always, whenever I go into contact centers, I'm blown away by the amount of expertise they have. It, it's just that sometimes we're not asked, really, for the expertise. No. And uh, I, I always say, if you want to know everything to do with your products and services and the problems with them, don't do a market research survey. Ask the contact centre advisors, because they will know the problems and probably your solutions for them. And, and I don't think we necessarily, you're absolutely right, that there are, there's an incredible amount of uh, talent in contact centres that we may, uh, we may well be wasting at the moment. And I like the comment, Nicola, you gave at one of your other presentations, that we often employ graduate in contact centers, very bright people, and then we give them a script to read. Yeah, then we wonder why they leave. <laughs> <laughs> Get the IT infrastructure right for the contact center, as 100% service reliability is crucial for critical satisfaction. I guess that's uh, one of those that's necessary, but not quite, uh, not quite enough. Um, we're seeing, what we're seeing is that although it's important to follow trends of which customers, which channels are becoming more popular, it's imperative to offer all channels and to make it easy to do business with. Top tip is the agent dashboard to be able to respond quicker to customer inquiries while driving business efficiency. Right, let's go and have a look at some of the uh, audience predictions, see what the uh, audience crystal balls are. Nicholas said, uh, a product for the future, using enterprise gamification to improve agent engagement and knowledge growth, thus improve customer service and experience. Oddly, I feel as if I did send that one in because uh, certainly that's something that. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Nicola, my namesake, for that one. But uh, it's, uh, gamification is one of those very big trends, and, and actually, my original research back in, um, well, actually about ten years ago, was around gamification in the contact centre, and it's, it's quite a fascinating area. So I agree with you. I think that that's uh, that's one that's definitely to watch for the future. Ah, I wonder if that was actually Nicola typing that on a smartphone under your desk there. I didn't know. Well, <laughs> There are many Nicholas out there that are all very talented. So here's another prediction, Mike. As the generation of PC smartphone users becomes older, this means the old person in relation to technology will no longer exist. This will mean that no one will be frightened of social media, chat, etc. This will drive down the need for phone calls for simple problems and inquiries. Um, I, I agree, and the digital divide is already going down. My and my mum, 75 years old, she has just got an iPad. Admittedly, I am now the technical support desk for her, but um, but she, yes, she's starting to uh, to really relate to a lot of the stuff that she can do online rather than phone. So yeah, I agree. I think that will change. Be interesting to see what's likely to happen in terms of call volumes overall, because I think uh, call volumes, Nicola, I think are, are falling. Is it? Yeah, we are getting a very big trend in. Um, across most sectors, really, around call volumes going down, 
but call handling times going up. So actually, sort of, if you look at the talk times, they're kind of plateauing, but um, the, the, the volumes are definitely going down. But we can see that complexity with call handling times going up. And I get a lot of panicky phone calls from operations managers going, help, my call handle times are going up. And I keep going, well, then your self-service strategy is now working. Yep. And that's not the answer they want, but yep. that is definitely what's happening. So Neris has got a tip, pr pr or prediction. Segmenting prospects and customers using SCV data. Not sure what that is. Anyone idea that? Uh, Neris, if you can help us with what SCV stands for. Customer value modeling to change customer journeys will become common practice. So I'm not sure if that's the reply delete, I think, comes off the uh, buttons on the chat room on that one. Uh, other predictions. My prediction for the future is companies would utilize home agents and have a large portion of the contact center working directly from home. I think this is the something Mike you've been banging on about. Uh, we've, done, you, we've done a webinar specifically on home agents I report on. Yeah. It's quite successful too, so absolutely very much a part of the future. Yeah, I think probably underplayed in the UK compared right. to other geographies. Yeah, the US is, is very predominant and I keep saying that this is an area where the technology is not a problem, it's a lot to do with talk jacket. Correct. Okay, it's got the same uh, same prediction there for, for uh, at work at home consultants, based office workers. Uh, Facebook won't be the channel of choice in 2020. <laughs> For people to engage with businesses, it would become over-commercialized and have far too many adverts. That's interesting. More than likely. Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> I, think <that's>, uh, <laughs> I think Facebook's one of those love-hate relationships, and I've got a few friends who love it and uh, a few don't. Oh, Thomas, I believe avatars will become more prominent, although actual vi video conferencing with agents is unlikely. So. Uh, Picking up on the yeah. Although, as I said, the, the growth yeah. on video is quite an interesting one, particularly for real expert stuff. Um, so things like mortgage advice, health advice, that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, avatars are an interesting one. Um, I guess I guess you can take calls from bed if you <laughs> if you send your avatar to work. But um, I think avatars. Um, if you can make a seamless transaction between the automated and the real person, I think avatars might work because. If you have an avatar that's just spouting the FAQs, it's probably yep. somewhat easier to read the FAQs sometimes. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Dion has said there's be a growth of virtual assistants or chatbots. Quite interesting. Uh, biometrics, transforming customer verification. Biometrics, Mike, that always seems to be that something's yeah. always just around the corner. It's like, yeah, well, it's still amazing, really. It's, it's, um, Evernote has taken sort of full your mass market. You know, it's, it's, I think there's one or two customers yeah. using it. I, I, we, I was digging through one of our archives about five years ago, biometrics just around the corner. I think you'd probably still say that. Uh, yeah. I'd yeah, still say that now. We're seeing a little bit in finance now on voice biometrics. So if you, you uh, record your voice biometric uh, and then say yeah. the sentence, it yeah. can verify who you are without going through the Good horrendous, give yeah. us your 85-digit number. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did notice today that walking into your building, Mike, uh, a lot of people were putting their fingerprint as their, yeah. uh, their way through. Uh, KPIs are going to change from hold and AHT to customer experience rating. Yeah. Uh, I would certainly love to see that. Let, right, let's take a couple more a couple more tips. Where do we get to about here? Um, thing, uh, we've covered that one or other. Tip for the future is knowing your frontline team feeling through physical indicators detected through contact sensitive technology, allowing managers to actively manage how people how people feel to improve well-being. Well, oddly enough, that was. That was precisely the subject of my initial PhD investigation, and uh, I was looking at links back to the other one, biometrics. So trying to sort of monitor things like heart rate and uh, galvanic skin response, the amount of sweat you're producing, to so figure out um, whether your agents are in a good state or not. Oddly enough, our union actually banned us from wiring our agents up in the end. Uh, <laughs> we had to do a little bit of a workaround around self-report of stress, but no, I, I, I actually think that that's a really interesting one around simply just monitoring the well-being of because it's going to become an even more complex job than it is already, and we do know there is a very distinct uh, mirror between the, the staff experience and the uh, customer experience, so yeah. So unless your internet connection is 100% reliable, cloud-based solutions are risky. Uh, no, no, actually not, not always. Uh, so, um, give us a call. Um, you know, PSDN is still there, and PSDN is pretty reliable. So from that perspective, that's always like a fallback. So, and I've also seen some hybrid hybrid models where you can, right. you know, there's some resilience built in on the, on the a park cloud, park cloud, that's correct. So with a variety of ways to do that. And Sue agrees with your single view of the customer is the way forward for the contact center. However, customer contacts, full history
repository for you being available also, BT. Also for large for outbound calls, live person detect as opposed to answer machine detection will be huge. Uh, I think there may well be some technology coming down the line on network answer machine detection, which we're in uh, discussions with uh, Ofcom and some of the carriers yep. uh, as we speak. So that might change things. Right, let's take a, a couple of questions for the uh, audience. Nicola Millard from uh, BT and Mike Murphy from Interactive uh, Intelligence. Uh, just a quick point that chat can be integrated into social media platforms. So how will that be measured, chat or social media? Yeah, and that, again, that's another, I didn't mention it, but that's another reason why I think web chat is so good because you, it's, it's a private channel rather sure. than a public channel and bridging between the public channel social media and chat is vital. But yeah, I mean, actually the measures are also very, very critical as well. And um, yeah, that's an intriguing one because you, you can do a response time on social, but then it's the case of often you, you, you maybe tweet on Twitter, for example, say, sorry, you're having a problem, here's a link to a web chat session, and then it's kind of up to the uh, to the person to go back to you. So I suspect that the measures then kick in once, once, uh, once the, guy, the, the people have engaged on the chat. And I think, Mike, you, you often say that, you know, this is often a feature of platforms that aren't yet integrated. Correct. Mm -hmm. The more you can integrate your platforms together, the more you can get a sort of common reporting mechanism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Also, I think as well, the... the, um, the on the social media side, if you will, it's, it's often that we actually deploy apps on, on your sort of your own sort of, you know, like, let's say you're a, like a, a retail store. On your sort of Facebook presence, uh, you actually put your apps in there. Uh, so within Facebook, so your, your customers can actually access those applications there and then sort of connect with you in a one-to-one -one style. So I think from um, the, the, the comments point of view, if you will, it's quite right. It's like this two types of social media. It's like broadcasting my feelings to a large community. And it's just like this one-to-one -one engagement, which I think really would be more like a, a chat. Mm. So a question from Lee. How do we convince, and this is a probably $64,000 question, how do we convince people, executives and decision makers, there is value in having less, fewer, better paid experts than a high number of lower paid, less skilled employees? I know. Is on a postcard. Yeah, and I think, it, again, getting the measures right. Easy is a nice one actually to use because we can connect it to churn, we can connect it to, to real financials and, and again, I showed you the figures earlier, that there is a very big link on getting the right people there um, on that particular one. So uh, it's a difficult one, but absolutely. I think that sounds like a good bit of edit editorial for us to uh, research and write and uh, see if we can get some expert opinions on uh, what, a, what the wider community thinks. So if you've got any any pointers, any things on that, if you'd like to drop a line either in through the chat room later on or if you'd like to send it through the easiest email for us is newsdesk at calltenderhelper.com or if you'd like to be interviewed on that, drop us a line and we'll see if we can uh, make that into, uh, into an article. Uh, Amanda says, question, for live chat, do you see proactive chat being more prevalent or do you have any experience of what customers think of this as a web experience when companies get it wrong? Um. So a lot of the studies we did was where companies that were getting it right, but I think that the wonderful thing about chat is that um, you can remove the button if there aren't appropriate agents available. A lot of web chat we found has come down to the positioning of the buttons, um, and I think that that's the very critical bit to get right, because otherwise you can get it horribly wrong, and uh, either have a chat button that when you push it nothing happens, or you know it, it's on the wrong bit of the page and it's very difficult to steer it to the appropriate agent. So I think uh, web, web chat, uh, good web chat seems to come down to, to good design, really. Okay, well, we're pretty well out of time. It's